Hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining me again for my reaction series on Attack on Titan. Today, we're going to be covering episode six of the final season, part two, and I'm super excited. Now, obviously, you've seen the episode. Um, you know that it's a bit of a change from the previous episodes. It isn't as world-changing and iconic and defining as the bombshells we got, like the beginning of the rumbling or the huge Grisha twist or going into the path dimension. It's not as huge as the uh, the moments that happened prior in the past three episodes. And so I'm looking forward to it just as much, but for different reasons. I've read the source material, you know this, so this is a point in the manga or in the story as things progress where the focus shifts a bit from Eren to uh, some of the side cast, some of his other friends, what's going on in the walls of Shiganshina as the rumbling uh, starts. And that leads to lots of moments and lots of more lower key storytelling comparatively, smaller stories, uh, more honed in and focused stories. And so I think for the previous episodes, the huge episodes and the huge moments, I loved how they adapted the previous, the previous uh, material. But I think that there's a lot of interesting creative things they can do with this material now. And so for that reason, I'm looking forward to how they adapt this uh, just as much as the moments that are comparatively bigger than the material in this episode specifically. I'm looking forward to seeing how the staff, uh, you know, convey the tone. What's the tone here? What do you emphasize? Which character moments? Which lines? Uh, are there callbacks you make? The music they use? The visual direction? The approach to colors? And uh, and all of this. I'm looking forward to really digging into how they interpret this source material specifically and uh, how they convey it and adapt it to us, because there are tons of things they can do with this, and there are tons of ways in which my appreciation for this source material can be elevated to a greater extent than the previous stuff was elevated, if that makes sense. I'm just really looking forward to their take on it, because, yeah, there are a lot of ways in which they can elevate the source material, or emphasize certain things, and I really look forward to that stuff. That's what I love most about reading an anime and then seeing how uh, a studio or a staff adapt it. Anyways, that's my preamble for this episode. Very much looking forward to it. I do hope that they didn't blow their load in the huge moments prior to this, because I do think that this material deserves just as much uh, quality treatment, and I hope it gets it. Uh, though, having said that, given the schedule, given the industry, I would, I do think that a draw, a little bit of a drop-off would be understandable. But my fingers are crossed that it isn't there, that that isn't the case. We'll see. As always, if you're interested in the next two episodes, uh, Early Access on Patreon, they are there, they are available the day this goes up on YouTube, so you can look into that if you're interested. A little something extra if you want to see what happens or my reactions and discussions for episodes 7 and 8, you can do that right now. And, uh, like always, just a reminder, every Monday morning we have the episode discussions over on Twitch. They've been tons of fun, lots of great insight, and so if you want to join uh, us for that, please feel free. Again, I will not spoil anything for anime onlys. Though, of course, there's always the chance of an asshole or two in chat, so just be aware of that. All that said, uh, let's get into this. I am really excited and uh, can't wait to see this new take on this source material. Let's do it. Could you imagine? あの島からどこ行ったの and here it sinks in. Oh. Oh, fantastic illustration there. He's, in his eyes, he's failed. Wow, the close-up of the food. Disrupted family lives. It's the apocalypse. What can they do? Oh. The hopelessness. You feel so much for him. He was the prime one right in there trying to stop him. 
Kino. Very obvious parallel to Aaron, but... Oh, the music. Hell of a backdrop. Almost trying to justify it now that it's happened, right? A very, very human reaction from Jean here. He's not convincing anyone, though. Is that really what- isn't that right? Yeah, like, is that really what you think? Oh, such a... Will you s Can you stop him? The tone is so somber, as it should be. It's so quiet, and then just slowly builds up as they talk about this. How must that feel for them, to be the benefactors of something like this? Oh, the, the silence. Oh, that's really good. And then, snap out. Then they snap out of it. It's understandable that he suggests that. He is sick of this. Connie's, Connie's sick and tired. The art is really great. The the expressiveness in models. Oh, oh, you can't see her eyes. Oh, great shot. That's a that's a great shot. Why? Another one. Another great shot. Yagris, they're green. They're not ready for this. this. Oh, Nile. At a girl. Music. Oh, this looks so great. Oh. So sharp. This looks amazing. And then we have the flashback to the kind girl who saved her. We're a family. We gotta keep the children out of the forest. It's beautiful. I'm loving how this is adapted. Something's got to stop this cycle. The band, where the band would have been. そいつは俺の中にもいる。
ていようとし続けるんだ。That's the core. More than anything, that right there is the core of Attack on Titan. Beautiful. Barricades? Barricades. Follow him. I can't wait to talk about this Keith moment. Oh, so beautiful. I love, I love what they're doing here. Huge season one trust parallels. Huge. Down to the minute details. Sorry, I'm fanboying. Very deliberate season one parallels too, with Jean, Jean per, uh, particularly, and the elevator scene. Oh, oh my! This looks spectacular. What? Rest in peace. Oh, Shadis. Louise? Oh. The blood spurting right out of it. Oh my, this, this is animated so beautifully. So smooth. And, uh, and visceral. Hmm. That's a cool, cool little shot there. The color palette, very, very stark. なるほど。<笑> Oh, and she is just completely lost now. Where does she go from here? <sighs> Illustrations, again, brilliant. <laughs> Lantern. Ever present. Connie She truly feels the weight of all this pain. She's truly sorry. She's back. That's a hell of a cliffhanger. Kind of encapsulates one of the core 
themes of Attack on Titan as a work in general, uh, particularly said by Niccolo uh, in that scene, that beautifully riveting scene. But uh, we'll talk about it in a second. So, uh, pretty easy when it comes to the chapters that were adapted for this episode. Basically, it was, a ch it was chapter 124. Unless I'm mistaken, there were no rearrangements, really. It was pretty much adapted one-to-one, -one, one chapter this episode. Although, as opposed to the first couple of episodes, which, you know, some of the recap and things like that f made it feel a bit padded out, this one didn't feel like it to me. To me, the pacing felt very, very good, very focused. Uh, it paused where it needed to and put weight on the moments where it needed to, but then it ramped up um, when it needed to. I think there was maybe a bit more time spent on the action scenes than I might have anticipated because, uh, you know, action can go by quickly at times when you're adapting source material. But they spent a lot of time on it, uh, more than I assumed they would, and I'm glad, delighted they did because the action was fantastic in this episode. Uh, we'll get to that in a second as we talk about the overall approach. But in terms of the structure, basically, this covered chapter 124, pretty much one-to-one. -one. It ended exactly where 124 ended. So this was one chapter and one episode. And so for the episode in general, the overall approach, this is what I was waiting for. This is, uh, this is what I was most excited for when I thought about these ch chapters like this being adapted. It was beautiful. It made me think about the source material in a way that I never really did. It made me appreciate it. It elevated my appreciation of this part of the manga a ton. A ton through audio, through visuals, through the tone, the music used, uh, some of the voice acting, some of the visual direction uh, choices. It was b wonderful, and I love the approach they did. It was spot on. Every, every little scene, every moment, every decision they make, I think, was spot on. And it was a beautiful adaptation. I thought it was fantastically done. And it helped me realize, like I said just uh, a minute ago, this... This episode is an encapsulation of one of the key themes of Attack on Titan. This theme echoes throughout the series. While I might as well just talk about it, it's that idea of getting out of the forest. It's that idea of promoting compassion, understanding, love, and forgiveness. Because that is the only way we can get out of this forest. That is the only way. If there is a way to stop this cycle of hatred, of violence, of bloodshed and death and misery. If there is a way, there's no guarantee that there is one, but if there is, it is centered in this compassion, this understanding, this uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness is key. And as Nicolo says in this episode, uh, you know, there are devils inside of everyone. Sorry, I have the manga right here just to refresh what the line actually was. But he says, there are devils inside of me, inside of you. That's why we've gotten to this place. That's why things have become this bad. But nonetheless, when he's asked, what do we do by Gabby and Kaya? He says, we have to get out of this forest. Just like Mr. Browse said, we have to get out of this forest. And even if we can't, we must keep on trying. This is an idea, I've, I've released an, uh, an edited analysis video, some people have called me stupid for saying that this is a main idea in Attack on Titan. It is. It's been touted throughout the entire series. This idea of, 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 of mutual understanding and compassion and love and forgiveness and all those things integrated together and perspective being the way forward. Not destruction, not a continuation of these things, even destruction on the scale of genocide, none of that will stop this. But through these these more wholesome, these more charitable, light interpretations of humankind, of mankind, like Kruger said to Grisha, you must love someone within the walls. If you don't have love, if you don't have this connection to other people, this mutual understanding, this compassion, this capacity for love, if we don't have that, then the cycle will only repeat itself. It's said right there. And so that love is a precursor to the things that Mr. Browse says about Sasha when he forgives her for literally killing his daughter. We've gotten into this forest. The world's a gigantic forest, and the darkness of humanity has gotten us there. It is up to us to be the bigger people, the adults, to be the bigger people to get the children out of the forest. We must get out of the forest. And unfortunately, that burden falls on the children as well, to find it within themselves to be forgiving, to mature emotionally in ways that, you know, it's it's hard to expect kids to mature in those ways, but they do, as Kaya does in this episode, as Gabby does. 
uh, that is, in my opinion, one of the core, if not the core, message of Attack on Titan. Getting out of that forest. And even if it seems hopeless, even if there is no hope, even as if it's futile, we must use this forgiveness, this love, this empathy to get out of the forest. And even if it isn't guaranteed, we have to keep trying. Because that's the only way this will ever stop. And this idea is echoed throughout this episode itself. A bunch of times, and we'll get into that, but I love that. That was that that's what I take away from this episode, the championing of that idea. Because it's everywhere. And uh also throughout the episode to sort of diverge a little bit, it was very nostalgic. There were callbacks galore, callbacks to Trost Arc through Jean commanding these scattered recruits who are way in over their head, totally green, these Jaegerists, who didn't realize the scale of what they were taking on and just kind of got caught up in ideology. A great focus on Keith. Uh, we're going to get into the specifics of that soon, but the focus on Keith itself, very nostalgic. The Jean leading these people, there's a direct callback to the elevator scene where they're shooting all the Titans uh, in Z Season one and the the most uh, skilled scouts come down from the rafters and kill the scouts. Uh, pretty much a direct parallel, I think, with them doing the 360 jumping off the tower and taking out the Titans uh, there. Very reminiscent of, of Trost. Uh, and then there's also the, the use of the song Barricades, one of the key, uh, one of the key musical defining mo musical themes of season two. And then, of course, there's the callback to Kaya and what happened to her and Sasha saving her. Uh, so many callbacks in this episode, very nostalgic in that way, and a great focus on second, more secondary characters, or characters that are less important than Aaron, obviously. Uh, Gabby, Kaya, Connie, Jean, Keith. One of, one of my favorite moments in the entire series for Keith here. Reiner as well. Some stuff for Niccolo. Just uh, lots of great work for the characters that we haven't seen in a few episodes, as they try to come to terms with what is happening. And to that end... The tone of this is very somber at first. Uh, the music gradually comes up and crescendos into this very loud, grand orchestral piece. But in the beginning, we have the four that are, uh, you know, reflecting on what came to like what came to pass, and it's understandably very subdued uh, as the dust settles. And that's perfect. There is like a silence there. There's a key moment where we see four glances uh, from the four characters: Connie, John, Sasha, and Mika. Uh, excuse me, Connie, Jean, Mikasa, and Armin. And the silence there is beautiful to let the moment sink in and to, through contrast, emphasize the weight. There's a constant backdrop of misery. In these scenes where people are talking or even the pure titans, the, uh, the, the pure titans that Zeke brought forth are attacking people, in the backdrop we have a constant marching of the colossal titans for the rumbling. Just a backdrop of pure misery and destruction. And that was very, very good for, uh, you know, nailing home the grand weight, for nailing home the stakes, right? The scale of this, this constant footsteps, this constant rumbling, always in the background. And uh, in tune with that, the color palette for this was very similar to the end of the last episode. Lots of reds, red tints, orange, fire, darkness, destruction, which made it very bold. Uh, I really loved how this episode looked. It was very very pleasing to the eye, as well as being, you know, dark to reflect the context. Um, and then the character art was so on point. Every character looked beautiful here. Uh, there were lots of very expressive expressions, <laughs> sorry for the redundancy, uh, came, when it came to Reiner, to Gabby, to Armin, to Yelena, uh, Jean, Connie, just uh, Mikasa, just great expressions throughout to really get across what these characters were feeling. Um, really loved it. Really bold and well drawn. And the animation. What about the animation? The fight scenes were spectacular. Very fluid. And not just quick cuts. There were sustained cuts of fluidity as these people fly around on their ODM gear as barricades play. Again, so nostalgic, but so fluid and brilliant. I mentioned callbacks before and nostalgia. There's also the Ragako village uh, callback to Connie's mom, which is a key factor of season two. Again, we have Mikasa saving Luis once again. Uh, from season one, episode six. The callbacks were just endless. They were everywhere. This episode was a direct reflection of certain things in season one and season two. And it's beautiful because it shows that when push comes to shove, even when it comes against fighting this friend of theirs, you know, you can tell they haven't fully come to terms with taking him on personally. But they are going to, even in this context, 
fight and protect as they have been doing this entire time. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, Connie aside, because Connie has some other motivations and some hang-ups at this point, which we'll get into, but uh, by and large, Mikasa, Jean, Armin, you know, it's a, such a difficult situation for them. And so I feel pride for them to be able to do their job and do it so well in this situation. And uh, people like Keith as well. And then the ultimate callback, of course, we have Annie, who we haven't seen since season one. But the thing is, it calls back to all these things and shows where we've come and how our characters will continue to think to do what they believe is right and act to protect and do these things. But the thing is, um, when the dust settles from the bombastic nature of the fights, it is dark. You know, one of the thing, one of the key characteristics of the Trost arc in the anime in particular is there's tons of rises and falls. There's inspiration and people getting pumped up and, you know, the operation to kill the Titans as you make your way throughout the city. And then there's a huge come down. There's huge highs, huge lows immediately as you see a bunch of your friends die. That's all throughout the Trost arc. But this was an extreme encapsulation of that because you know, when the dust settles and the fighting is done and the adrenaline wears off, the apocalypse is happening. Genocide is currently occurring and your friend, your dear friend, is the center of it. Anyway, so let's go start chronologically. We start with Mr. Leonhardt. I, I, I mentioned in the previous discussion I didn't remember exactly if these people had been transported to the Paths Realm or if they were just hearing the voice and that was just a visual representation that wasn't meant to be taken literally. It's confirmed uh, in this episode, my mistake, that they did get transported there. Everyone's talking about being put into this dimension. So uh, my mistake, I just misremembered. You know, like I said in the beginning of this, ep this reaction series, I will forget lots of things surely and i did so uh that's just a confirmation of the logistics there they were literally shown this dimension put in this dimension so then we have a scene with reiner and gabby gabby's looking for falco reiner is not doing well uh he's not healing well at all his armor was taken off he's forlorn here essentially and you really feel for him because you see in his expression there's a very key expression as he realizes aaron succeeded the rumbling has started and there's nothing we can do except run away until we die, essentially. He blames himself here. This was his purpose right here, to protect the people he loves, particularly the kids, Gabby and Falco. But his hometown, you know, his family, uh, the world is what it came to. And in his eyes, he failed. He did the best he could, but he came up short because Aaron succeeded. And so he feels this failure, and he is so forlorn and lost and he's given up hope and i think that's a big reason why he's not healing properly as well and you really feel for him but it's understandable that he can't just bounce back from this uh this loss but who has recently done a 180 essentially who has experienced the crux of her character arc and who is now carrying out her newly found ideals gabby She's there to pick up the pieces for Reiner, like he did so many times for her in the past as he tried to protect her. She's here to support him. She is taking on the mantle. She re she resolves to find Falco and stop this. She says, we have to stop Aaron Jaeger. Where Reiner sees it's impossible, she sees a possibility. And that that's that's key, because you need that hope. Like, like Niccolo says about a different subject, but even still, even if it's impossible, you gotta keep trying. To get out of this forest and we have the parallel as gabby becomes more open-minded as open-minded as aaron did um after he realized the truth of the world yet goes about it in a completely different way as she ties her ponytail direct visual allusion to aaron uh, talking to himself in the mirror and resolves okay gotta fight we gotta fight and uh, this is it this is, this is everything. It's her turn to stop this cycle. She's been perpetuating it in her eyes. It's her turn to stop it. It's go time. It's a great moment for her. And more or less the manifestation of the things she's talked about in previous episodes, this is her doing it. And then we transition. Um, there's a beautiful track playing, by the way, as this happens. Because I'm talking about this in a very positive way because it is a positive change for her. But at the same time, the situation is dire. We have Reiner not doing well in the back as she sort of very touchingly tucks him in and leaves him to, see, to, to, to be safe in this house. But there's haunting music going on in the background. And then it transitions to the party, the crew, reflecting on what's happened. And the tone is, again, very somber, somber very lamentable, very understated and down-to-earth 
as we see what's gone on and the characters come to terms with it. Jean does something very human here. He talks about, he tries to rationalize it. This is what had to happen, you know, they they called us devils, they they attacked us, they attacked our homeland. They had to know this was, this was what was going to come to be, right? That's essentially what he says. And he's saying these words, but his voice is very much betraying that. And his facial expressions is betraying that. You can see he's trying to convince himself and rationalize for himself that this is something he can get behind. But it isn't. That isn't him. It's never been something he could get behind. And so it's easier to try to convince yourself that this is okay. But he just fails. He is not that type of person. The type of person to be okay with the genocide. No matter what. And so I think it's a very hu human and nuanced thing for him to con try to convince himself and rationalize this and justify it. But at the end, he just isn't able to. Because he's not that type of person. None of them are. You know, a common theme through the this story, as, as it reaches its end, is the idea of characters trying to convince themselves of things and trying to lie to themselves... Um, to go in a certain direction that continues here. Armin did it in the in the previous episode. Uh, Aaron's done it to an extent throughout a lot of the series. And uh, yeah. And they all deal with the situation differently. We have that great silent shot of each of their eyes. Love that. And then Connie, you know, he brings up his mother. If we're going to feed Falco to someone, my mom. It's It was stated in this episode that Connie's been taking care of his mother for four years. So... How sad is that? Uh, your heart goes out to him there, because I can't imagine the pain in having to see his mother, who is the only Titan who cannot move, there every time he goes. That's horrifying. That's beyond words. And so I feel his pain. I can't relate to it, obviously, but I feel it, and I sympathize with him extremely deeply. And so, is it drastic? Is it impulsive for him to take Falco with him? Yeah, of course, but it's very understandable, very consistent, very human. He's been teetering on the edge. You know, the betrayal we saw in episode one. The betrayals of so many people close to him have caused him to see the world with such jaded eyes, and he wants to be able to trust people, but he's been burned so many times that he just can't. And it's caused so much pain and internal conflict and anguish that he's just sick of it, and he, at this moment just wants his mom back. Um, how human is that? Uh, so I think it's very understandable that he, he gets out of here. He takes Falco with him to try and do that. It makes sense. And I think you put yourself in his shoes, it's very easy to see where he's coming from. The poor guy's been through the ringer, and this is how he deals with it. And it all makes sense. It's all consistent, all coherent. I, I get it. Uh, and then we get some shots of Yelena. Great shots. As there's chaos all around her, people running around and you know, trying to escape or whatever, and you just see the bottom of her face below her eyes. You can't see her eyes. And then when you do see her eyes, pure shock and horror. She essentially is has lost her reason for existence. She put everything into Zeke. You know, she thought of Eren as a deity, but her where she put her cards were in Zeke. She believed that he would lead them into this new age of prosperity, uh, this new world. And it's clear that something has gone wrong if if all this is happening, something has gone very wrong. And so she wonders what's happened to her god. Her god is... her god is gone. The only reason she's able to operate and gesticulate and be so dramatic and engage in this joy is because she sees it all in service of the ideal world she seeks and the ideal world that Zeke has started to lead her to. She believes in that so much that when it's taken away from her, she feels like she's nothing. She's a hollow shell. Everything she's been doing. This entire episode, the only role she had essentially was her looking completely lost and forlorn in a shell of herself. Because uh, her entire reason for existence, it seems like right now, has been swept out from under her feet. Also, as one might expect, in the chaos of the pure titans everywhere and the rumbling and the destruction, the Jaegerists who ha were, were enlisted to, you know, help help the operations with Aaron, help Flock, help all of that. They are in complete disarray. They're not ready for this. It's it's that callback I talked to about trust of these recruits who are essentially up Shit's Creek without a paddle. They don't know what they've gotten themselves into. They're green. They have not seen this. And so they're in complete disarray. They're they're completely overwhelmed. They have no organization and they cannot fight back. They just have no leadership. In particular, the one with glasses is the most identifiable as one of the ones who were enlisted. And yeah, they are 
they're in way over their heads. They're not ready for this at all. They talk the talk. They are not able to walk the walk. They bought into Flock's ideals. They cannot follow through. They are not seasoned professionals. And uh, it's very clear here. And then we have Mr. Browse and his family and Kaya and Niccolo running away from a titan. I think that's Nile. I'm pretty sure that's Nile. It sure as hell looks a lot like him. Um, I'm like 99% sure that's him. And so Nile, ironic that he helped Gabby and Falco and Colt get out of there in human form, now in titan form, completely lost control of his faculties, now a monster. He is doing the opposite of how he lived in the end, his defining character act. Uh, very sad. But, so he's chasing um, the the Browse family, the Mr. and Mrs. Browse, the kids, Niccolo, Kaya. And Kaya sees, you know, re uh, flashbacks of what happened to her mom. Is this going to happen to me now? And, you know, she's cornered. And they can't reach out and help her for their own safety. Niccolo's holding them back. It's a super heartbreaking moment, potentially. Uh, again, great character art and expressions everywhere. And then, who saves them but Gabby? Brilliantly, smoothly animated and uh, love the sound effects and sound design. And she sticks her gun in the into the Titan's face and blood comes out just through sticking her gun in, her gun in there. And shoots, the head comes flying off, and we see this great shot of her bathed in blood, but the context so different from her vengeful self. Now she's fighting to protect, to stop this cycle, not to perpetuate it. It's beautiful, beautifully done, beautifully executed scene. And how 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 wonderful is it that the first thing Kaya sees is a flashback to when she was saved all those years ago by, by Sasha. Back on the farm, she saved, essentially, Gabby and Falco. Uh, she didn't blow their cover because she said, my sister, my older sister, Sasha, would have would have reached out to you guys and would have helped you guys. And so I'm going to do the same thing. That favor is returned here. You know, Kaya and Gabby's relationship is very interesting because they each have periods of understandable but impulsive uh, venge revenge, basically. In the beginning, Kaya was uh, not going to blow their cover at all. No matter what Gabby did, Gabby was very hostile towards her and she didn't care. She was kind to them. Um, when she learned the truth of what Gabby did, she completely changed her tack. She hated her. She wanted to kill her. And Gabby went the other way. She became more open to the truth and she was shocked. And eventually, here, she gets the idea that she's perpetuating this cycle. She's got to change. She's got to change the, the way she interacts with the world and what she does. She's got to fight to protect. And so that's what she does here. While all the while, Kaya hates her and wants her to die because of her killing Sasha. So it's like uh, they parallel one another and mirror one another. They're like opposite, uh, ob like a dichotomy. Uh, very interesting how they develop over time. And then they meet here when Gab Gabby breaks the cycle here. And their relationship their dynamic, more than anything, is the idea of the children learning how to get out of the forest. Gabby can't stand what the Eldians have done, and she she has this agenda against Eldians indoctrinated into her, but she moves past that. She learns about the world. Kaya hates Gabby because of her killing Sasha, but here, through this expression that Gabby does of saving her, this expression of protection and reaching out, she reaches to Kaya. What will get these children out of the forest? What will get us out of the forest? This connection, this understanding. And so Kaya forgives her here, uh, and it's it's really beautiful. That is one of the ways this theme is communicated. And then Gabby, despite having killed Sasha, is completely protected by everyone. By Niccolo, who hated her at first, and who he himself is able to forgive and protect her here. He's, he's able to be the bigger person and let go and forgive and let go of his hatred and let go of his want for revenge and save Gabby here because he realizes what needs to be done and the person, type of person Gabby is now. So Niccolo portrays it here. Mr. Browse is a personification of this theme and has been since the beginning and they all follow in his stead. This idea of, you know, love, understanding, compassion, and forgiveness. That is the way forward. And then they had that beautiful speech uh, that beautiful bit of dialogue as the music swells. We have to get out of the forest. And even if it seems futile, we've got to keep trying. That is Attack on Titan. That is looking for these solutions. This mutual understanding being the way forward. And committing to that, even in the face of futility. 
holding on to that, that hope, even if it seems foolish, even if it seems stupid and redundant and like it won't get you anywhere, that hope itself is the path to it. I've talked about uh, Aaron Kruger. Then we also have uh, Uri, who says, what was it that stopped the strife between us? It was not violence. It was not blood. It was understanding and um, connection. It's just beautiful how that is portrayed. And it's portrayed very strongly here as the entire family protects the person who killed Sasha, the, their, their daughter and their big sis and uh, potential lover for Niccolo. The core message, the core message right here, uh, communicated through Niccolo better than I could have ever articulated it. It's, it's beautiful. Gabby and Kaya communicates, I was a devil. No, I was a devil. We are all potentially devils, but we must find it within ourselves to be bigger people or else we will never get out of this forest. And then we have, you saw my realization as barricades, that beautiful track starts to swell and, and bleed in. We have the scene where the Jaegerists are being overtaken. They're about to die because of the pure titans. And who comes to save them? Keith Shoddis. The second huge portrayal of this theme. Shoddis himself takes it upon himself to do what's right in this situation. Who is he protecting here? The very people who beat him nearly to death. Uh, just a little bit ago. Flock enlisted these Jaegerist recruits and the requirement was that they beat Keith Shoddis to within an inch of his, uh, an inch of his life uh, as a representation of getting rid of the old ways. You know, these are the new ways. He's a representation of that. Kick his ass, like, destroy him. Keith was completely taken apart, and he had no chance. He was ganged up on and beaten. And yet, in this moment, he's, he's, he, uh, he fights to protect them. It's such an admirable thing. It takes immense heart and conviction to do that to people who have completely betrayed you and hurt you in such awful ways. But he does it because he sees the bigger picture and he sees what's right and what's necessary in this moment. They have no hope. Like, they are against an apocalypse. They are against a cataclysm, the rumbling. And if any of them want to survive this, if there is to be a tomorrow, they have to band together. He sees the bigger picture here. And he is willing to put what they've done to him aside for that to help protect them. They are, of course, their assets. Uh, they're needed. Every body who's able to potentially kill a pure titan is needed in this situation. And he realizes that and sees the bigger picture and is able to put aside, Not, I'm sure he doesn't forgive them, but put this aside and lay his life down for them and, and put himself out there, put himself in harm's way, put his life at risk for people who put his life at risk. It's not quite forgiveness, because this is something of necessity, but it's again that core theme of, if we are to find a way through, we have to be together. And he sees this. He has been so critical of himself in the past for just being a bystander, for not being a special person. To me, he it takes a special person to be able to do this, to be able to be so courageous in this moment. Uh, it's a wonderful moment for Keith. I love it. And he says something extremely similar to what Mikasa says when she's rousing the troops in the middle of her kind of death wish after learning that Aaron died in season one. Another callback. This is the way forward. Not through holding on to hatred, but through togetherness. As hard as it may be sometimes, it's difficult, but nothing worth having ever comes easy. It's never going to be easy to stop this cycle. It's going to be the hardest thing possible. And this is the path to it. And these people understand Keith understands, Mikasa, uh, Armin, Jean, who's leading the troops so admirably. Great episode for Jean as he, as he, as he, as he takes up the mantle of being this leader once again, just like he did in Trost. Um, gathers these disparate, this disparate, these disparate troops, and binds them together and gives them leadership. And that's what they needed because after this, they were doing their part. They were fighting. You know, they were they were doing it. What they needed was someone to bind them together. Shadis did that, Jean did that. And it's very tross like in execution. And Barricade's playing, you know, Barricade is a very high tempo, in some ways very sweeping, and um, it's, a, it, it's a bit of a lighter tone than one might expect for this context of the story, as the rumbling is happening. Footsteps of doom, right? So some might think that it's not totally appropriate to use that song. I totally disagree. It's great because of the whole nostalgic feel of this episode and all these callbacks back to earlier seasons. But it's also great because more than anything, this song represents or um, maybe not represents, but makes you feel that togetherness as these people are working together to do what needs to be done. 
uh, it makes you feel that ascent, that energy. That is what's needed in these times. And that energy is conveyed beautifully tonally through the Barricades song insert. I loved it. I loved what they did. And they start uh, uh, instrumental. And then they go into lyrics as things ramp up. It was so good. I got... I don't know if you could tell, but I was emotional throughout the whole thing because of just how how well it conveyed this theme through music, audio, the tone. Everything was spot on. This is the way forward. Uh, follow Mr. Browse's lead, you know, from the micro level, uh, on the streets, little bits of forgiveness and holding, uh, reaching out for one another and, you know, taking the path forward to laying down your life for your fellow man um, in these conflicts even when they didn't do the same for you. Bigger picture, being the bigger person. It's it's so much, it's so great. Everyone has their differences, everyone has their different ideologies, but when it comes down to it, they're all born into this world, and in this moment, they need to forget all of that and fight together to protect that. And beautiful animation throughout this whole, this whole barricades fight sequence, starting from shot is saving them, continuing throughout beautiful shots everywhere great direction great flow uh, great animation of these action scenes i love the th use of 3d swiveling around the tower as they uh went down and and uh and attacked all the titans as jean's leading them great explosions and shot is leading them a leader a true leader of men leading them doing what needs to be done and saying you know you don't have to fight these titans just lure them to the fort we'll take care of the rest we'll do the rest or the other people are mamika sajan everyone else they'll take care of them um and fear terror in these jaegerists eyes particularly the one with the glasses and they but they do it nonetheless they work together it's cheesy you know it may sound it seems cheesy oh this togetherness this um you know very shonen-esque themes one might say that's what this is all about. This is what this has always been about. And it's very, it's so well adapted, so well written by Isayama, so well adapted in this episode. And I can't stress enough how good the ODM gear scenes looked. Uh, those are so smooth and so fluid and beautiful. Uh, and then we see Pixis, one of the Titans, lured there. Niall died earlier, Gabby killed him. And, um, well, killed his Titan. He was basically already dead. And Pixis here. We see him there, and there's a sad look in his eye. Um, it's almost like Pixis, Pixis has never been a sad person. And almost through the way that he looks so sad, his Titan looks so sad, it's almost like he isn't really in there, is he? That was never Pixis. But at the same time, you could also argue uh, there's conflicting feelings you could feel. You could also argue that maybe he's in there and trapped, and that's the sad look on his eye. And then by having him rest in peace that is helping him there um i don't know exactly how i feel about it maybe the latter either way a couple of interpretations you can get there from pixis's look there uh, very expressive as well and it's tough for armin mikasa and jean but jean you know taking up the mantle this episode says let's do this uh and they do it i think armin is the one who does it who actually pulls the trigger with the lightning spear and like he says we would not have gone this far without you a rest in peace. Uh, which is true. Without Pixis, they would not have gotten this far at all. They would have stagnated early on in Season 1 if he didn't believe Eren uh, during the Trost arc, if he didn't believe in him, if he didn't help with the coup d'etat. All these little things throughout. They would not have gotten this far without him. And now is his time to rest as he, just like Ervin did, just like all these people before him, the scouts, everyone else, allows the future generations to carry on his legacy. He sacrificed, well, he didn't sacrifice himself, but he dies here hoping that those he taught, those he mentored, will carry on his will. And they are determined to do so, as Armin says here. And so this barricade scene is going on, but then it sort of ends. And there's this hush over everything as the gravity of what's happening kind of soaks into everyone. I had gotten so hype into these scenes. I thought it was so great. The show was definitely indulging itself in these great, amazing scenes. But when the song fades and all that's left is the continuous rumbling after all the pure titans are dead, Jean is just sitting there looking. This is what we're left with. You know, it's great that we did all that. Now look what's left. A literal cataclysm. The rumbling. So what do we do now? Do we just run away? Do we hide? Do we let it happen? It's a miserable situation. And like I said, like Trost, 
there were lots of highs and lows in that arc, very drastic, to show the sort of uh, multifaceted nature of war and how fast things can go bad and how fast people can be inspired. Here is a drastic come down of the highest level. In This is the darkest one. This is the darkest the series has ever been, and that's saying something. And you really feel it through the silence, the hush after those action scenes. Uh, Flock comes back, the menace that he is. He is a... He is just the worst, and Yelena continues to be despondent, not saying anything, just looking on uh, in complete shock, great expressions of her, again, that forlorn look in her eyes. You can see that she just lost everything. She's essentially a shell, like I said. She seems to have given up, and that's communicated very well through the, the illustrations. Oh, and sorry, just going back for a second, uh, another parallel uh, within the midst of the barricades scene, the, the fights. Uh, Mikasa saving Louise um, happens again, another callback. And Mikasa, who clearly disagrees with Louise about a bunch of things, nonetheless, like like everyone else, is willing to put aside these differences because these are lives at stake. And and this moment, they need they need to do this. They need to they it's what needs to be done. Now, will that lead to the Jaegerists, every single Jaegerist agreeing with them? Uh, that remains to be seen. You know, Flock Flock uh, didn't give much of a much of an indication that he might go in that direction, did he? And say what you want to about about the guy, but he has been shown and proven to be able to band people around a cause. So if he is not one hundred percent with uh, Jean and and Mikasa and Armin uh, and Shadis and all that they did to sh demonstrate this togetherness, uh, despite whether person the person was Jaegerist or whatever if he is not open to that which he doesn't seem to be there will be people to band around him and the conflict is not done as great as these scenes were in showing this forefronting this main theme that doesn't mean everything is solved and flock is the menace at the center of it but yeah so flock makes himself known puts a gun to yell on his head she's completely despondent her desire to change history all that dream is completely gone and uh so she does she isn't even responding and flock tells her to gather her troops, um, her group, because they're arrested. And then Mr. Browse reaches out to Armin and Mikasa, brings them to Gabby and the rest of his family and Nicolo and Kaya, where she asks, where's Falco? You know, I don't want to fight. I'm through with all that. I just want to save Falco. Um, his confession and and w everything, everything about him has really got, gotten through to her. In being faced with the possibility of losing him, now all she wants now is to get him back realizing what all that he's done for her, all that he's sacrificed. When people are faced with the highest stakes, you really think about what matters most to you at a base level. And for her right now, what she wants most is Falco. Then they say, Connie took Falco. We don't know what's going on there, but he took him, and uh, he's tr gonna try to resurrect his mother. They're gonna obviously try and stop that, particularly Gabby. So, so Gabby puts forth, she wants to save Falco. Armin and Mikasa tell, tell her, Falco has taken, or sorry, Connie has taken Falco to feed to his mother so that she can become human again. And in realizing that this is the incident they're talking about, she apologizes. She apologizes for something she had no, she had nothing to do with, but nonetheless feels their pain, feels their sorrow, and feels sorry for them. And her solution here is very key. Note the subtlety in the way she words these things. So she apologizes for this, uh, very key to her progression and, and development and changes. But the distinction here is that she offers another solution. She doesn't say we must stop Connie, we must kill Connie, anything like that. What she says is, she says, I'm sorry, I understand where he's coming from. Not literally, but this is the subtext. Because she has literally just seen a person she loves, or I think she loves, turn into a titan, and she realizes the pain of that, so she can empathize with, with Connie and wanting to bring his mother back. So she understands that, and so she her, her solution isn't, let's stop him from doing that, it's, is there not a way for him to be able to do that, and also for Falco to be saved? So she offers another solution instead of resorting to violence. That in itself is huge for her character. Uh, it offers, it, it shows her broader understanding of the world, her empathy, and her uh, unwillingness now to resort to violence and continuing the cycle. It's very subtle, but very good. 
very great um, benchmark of how far she's come now in such a short sp period of time in the grand scheme of things. Then we get to the shocking plot point of uh, how, how Gabby describes how the uh, all the armor from Reiner um, just came right off. And then they realize, or Harmon in particular realizes, that means a certain someone is probably out of her is probably out of her deep slumber of her beauty sleep. And lo and behold, for the first time since season one, episode twenty-five, we see Annie in the flesh, um, walking around. Well, not literally, but you know, outside of the crystal. And a uh, hell of a cliffhanger there, right? It was a great way to end the original chapter, great way to end the episode as well, um, and put a cap on this stunning adaptation. Loved the episode. Absolutely loved it. I hope I got that across well in this uh, in this reaction and discussion. Um, but I think that's about all I have to say. Uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed the episode too. I hope you enjoyed my discussion and reaction of it. And uh, yeah, I think that's about all I have left to say. Looking forward to seeing how they continue to adapt this season. It's been so good so far and long may it continue, hopefully. Many thanks for watching.